Okay, in this scene we're going to go ahead and get prepared to uh, start making our model and uh, basically we're just going to set up with a little bit of planning and uh, take a look at some of the reference uh, art that we have. Uh, right now I'm using the asset browser from the uh, utility panel and we're going to be making um, an object something like this, just a little pagoda. Okay, so what we're going to go ahead and do uh, first is prep our scene um, in regards to unit setup. And make sure we're set to the size, the units we want to use. By default, it's generic. I'm going to go ahead and set mine at metric. Okay, now we're going to go ahead and make a, uh, a plane object, which we're going to map our reference image onto. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and set the units of this to one by one. And I'm just going to kind of guess on the size for the moment um, as far as how big this object is. We'll need to adjust that in a little bit. Um, in the future. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and move it into position just so that it's uh, roughly uh, on the ground plane but uh, back a little ways. We'll model in front of that and uh, when we get started modeling. And uh, what I'm going to go ahead and do is make sure I name this object just just so it's clear in my scene uh, what the heck that object is. Okay, um, I'm going to switch to an edge face mode, and by default what you'll see is these planes are split into triangles. And we're going to go ahead and get rid of that by switching this to uh, editable poly mode, which is a quad based system. Okay, that'll get rid of that little interior triangle for us. Okay, uh, right clicking on the viewport labels, we can switch to uh, any different display options we want. Um, I'll also be using some hotkeys for that as well. Okay, now we're going to go ahead and assign a material from the material editor onto this object. And uh, I always make sure to name my materials as I'm doing this. Okay, down in the maps rollout or in the little shortcut button next to diffuse, what we're going to do is go ahead and add a bitmap in there, okay, which is just a texture. Okay, and we want to make sure and choose bitmap here. And we're going to go ahead and choose the uh, reference image that we were taking a look at earlier. Okay, so just uh, find that on your hard drive. Go ahead and uh, activate it. And then you want to hit this show map in viewport button to, so that the texture is actually displayed on the object. Otherwise, it'll be just the default color. Okay, now what we're going to go ahead and do is... Um, Go ahead and check the size of this thing. What I'm going to do is just make a little box here, okay? And I'm just going to make that box at proper door height and match that up against the door on our reference image. We're actually just going to use the scale transform to alter the overall scale of that reference image so that it's right proportions, it's, it's the right size um, for what you need it to be. Okay, so I'm just creating a little box here and we're going to go ahead and set its height. I'm going to go ahead and do this through uh, the type ins. Okay. Go ahead and set that size and hit uh, create. Okay, and we've got a box that is sized uh, just about like a doorway should be. Okay, as you can see, our reference image is uh, a little bit too big, so we may need to scale it down just a hair. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and select that and uh, go ahead and scale it down just so it, it fits a little bit better. Okay, I'm right clicking to access, move, uh, rotate, and scale, whatever I need. Okay, you can also access that from the main toolbar as well. Okay, so I'm just going to go ahead and move it into position and just kind of make sure I get it in the... Uh, yeah, it lines up about right with that doorway. We know that doorway box is, is the right size. Um, and now we see that our uh, reference image plane is the right size as well. Okay, so we've got that pretty much set. We can get rid of that reference box. It really doesn't matter. It was just a temporary helper for us for the most part. Okay, and uh, what we want to go ahead and do now is um, make this object so we can't select it. Okay, and you can do that by right-clicking and choosing Freeze Selection. But the problem we have is by default, it'll be displayed in gray, which we don't want. So I'm going to go ahead and unfreeze that. 
select it I'm gonna right click again and this time go to the object properties okay and when we get in here over in the bottom left hand corner there's a checkbox for show frozen in gray we don't want that to have hap to happen um, go ahead and hit OK so now when we freeze it this time it will not display in gray it'll just display um, as normal but we're not able to select it okay this will be nice when we're modeling because we won't accidentally bump it and move it in the wrong position um, as we're working so um, pretty much we're we're all set up now we're ready to start going on the modeling uh, we've kind of set up our plan and we're ready to go Okay, now that we're all set up with our reference image, we're going to go ahead and actually start cr constructing this model. We'll be doing this uh, basically using uh, a form of box extrusion. So we're going to go ahead and make a box. We're just going to start from the uh, pretty much the basement up. So I'm going to go ahead and just kind of eyeball a box um, kind of in the por portion where that platform is. I'm going to go ahead and set its size over here. Okay, and I, I want to make sure it's square, so uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, just, what I'm doing is doing a copy-paste. I'm just dragging over that, copying and pasting the values in, rather than having to type them in each time, which is uh, a little bit tedious at times. And I'm uh, just going to take a look at things, make sure it's okay. I'm going to bounce over to the Modify panel and give this guy a name. Always good to name your objects um, as... Uh, box one through a thousand won't be particularly useful. After that I'm going to right click choose convert to editable poly that's our uh, quad based uh, polygon modeling system. Okay, Switch to edge face mode uh, I tend to like that quite a bit when I'm working because it's uh, kind of a hybrid wireframe and shaded mode. And also if we want to look through this guy we can hit alt X on the keyboard that'll switch us to see-through mode which uh, makes it really easy to see the uh, reference image behind. I'm gonna go ahead and dig this uh, basement in a little bit and what that's gonna help with is as this object is placed in game if the terrain is uneven okay we don't want this thing uh, to cantilever outward uh, so basically it'll stay buried in the ground a little bit it's not a bad idea to do that. Okay, I can um, actually select vertices and type in their heights if I want to as well. Okay, now I'm uh, going to go ahead and take a look at this uh, reference image, and you'll see it looks a little bit fuzzy. So uh, what we may want to do is go ahead and sharpen things up. Uh, right now, this uh, reference image is not being called at the highest resolution it can. So I'm going to go to the Customize menu. Uh, and then I'm going to affect my uh, viewports display option. Okay, I'm going to configure my driver. I'm running Direct 3D, and set them to the highest level that I possibly can. That'll be 1024 and 512. Okay, now the reference image should look a little bit more crisp as we um, are working. Sometimes you need to refresh your screen. That's why I switched to wireframe real quickly. And um, now it should be a little bit easier and, and uh, to look at and judge as far as things go and it won't have that soft edge look. Okay, so uh, now I'm going to go ahead and just move these things around wherever I need it. If I need to scale them down a little bit, I can go ahead and do that. Okay, you'll notice I work off the right click quad menu quite a bit. Um, I'll right click to access, move, rotate, and scale. Okay, you can also access those by hitting W, E, and R. Okay, and I'm switching to edge sub-object mode. And what I'm going to do is add an extra row of uh, geometry around there by using the connect function. So if I select edges and choose connect, it will draw a line all the way between them. Okay, also, uh, if I want to select that whole row of edges, I can click on one edge and hit loop, and that will select any edges that go end to end. Okay, and I'm going to go ahead and move those up. Uh, looks like we've got a little bit of a uh, extruded area uh, for a little platform right on top of this. So I'm going to go ahead and select those polys. Okay, and I'm just going to extrude them outward. Okay, I want to double check. I 
have a good selection on this first. It's always a good idea to double check your selection. After that, I'm hit, gonna hit the little extrude settings button. And you can see by default, all these polygons try to get extruded in the same direction, which is not what we want. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and switch that to local normal. Okay, local normal will extrude them all out as a group based off of their local orientation. Similar to by polygon, but by polygon will split them at the corners where they meet. So we're gonna just choose local normal. I can go ahead and adjust exactly how much it's uh, being extruded with that little setting set spinner. Okay, and I hit OK when I want to register that. Okay, looks like that extrusion looks pretty decent. Um, and so we're just going to kind of take a look and, and think about how we're going to handle this next portion. And I'm just going to go ahead and scale that center polygon in a bit so that I can extrude straight up and get uh, the main body of the uh, building established. With that, I'm going to go ahead and hit OK. OK, and I'm going to select all these verts. It seems it looks like it's a little bit wide when I, when I first did it. So I'm going to go ahead and select all the verts for that middle area. And I'm going to go ahead and just go into top view where it'll be easy to scale them on the X and Y axis. That's that little junction area on the gizmo. Scale them in a little bit and that'll just tighten everything up so it fits a little more closely uh, in relation to our reference image. Okay, so that's all looking pretty good. Uh, the next thing I want to do is go ahead and work my way up into the roof. Uh, once again, I'm going to do an extrusion. Okay, select the polygon, and I'm going to go ahead and get this guy going in a second here. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and use the settings button once again, adjust my height, oops, I'm going to go ahead and use bevel instead. Bevel basically allows me to go ahead and extrude it and scale it at the same time. So it's kind of an all-in-one function rather than having to extrude it and manually scale it. And that looks pretty good. So I'm going to go ahead and hit OK there. Okay, so uh, the basic height of that looks pretty good. But if you take a look at the reference image, actually that roof has a little bit of a bend to it. Okay, so I really need an, a little extra um, loop of geometry around that area. So I'm going to go ahead and select those edges running right down the middle. And I'm going to use the connect function once again. Okay. And we could go ahead and set these, uh, the amount of connections, okay, the subdivisions higher if we wanted to. One's probably fine for us right now though. Actually, I did two there. And I'm going to go ahead and move those down a bit, scale them outward so they fit the reference image. Okay, I'm right clicking and accessing move and scale quite a bit. And then I'm going to go ahead and do the next row, scale them outward as well. And now we've got a nice kind of arc coming out from the underside of that um, roof area. Okay, so that's looking pretty good. I'm not going to worry about some of the detailing right now, but I'm going to go ahead and move that back to get it out of our way just a bit more. And we're going to start working on that little platform that's right on top of the roof. Okay, so how I'm going to do that is I'm going to go to Polygon Sub-Object Mode. Uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 on your keyboard will let you quickly access your sub-object modes. Okay, and what I'm going to do is use Inset. Okay, what Inset is is basically a zero extrusion. Okay, it gives you this kind of picture frame effect. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and use Inset, hit OK. Okay, and now I can go ahead and just... bevel 
that up and in. Okay, Alt X once again to switch to see through mode. Okay, I'm make a few adjustments here with any settings I want to do to get that polygon roughly the right size and hit OK. Okay, so we've got the little platform established. Now, uh, basically, we want to set things up so that uh, we're ready to create that next floor. And so what we'll go ahead and do is to go ahead and do another inset. Okay, we're going to ignore the little railings for the moment. We'll go ahead and add those on a little bit later. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and establish another inset here, which will form the kind of base for our next uh, floor. Okay, I might need to check the scale on this. I just did an inset by eyeballing. It looks like those vertices may be off just a hair. Okay, so what I'll probably need to do is scale them all in just a little bit so that they're uh, roughly in the right position for that next floor uh, to start. Okay, I'm also uh, toggling between my uh, different viewports quite a bit. Okay. Uh, you can use uh, Alt W to maximize the view. Also use uh, F for front, P for perspective, etc. So we've pretty much got the base floor blocked out. Now we'll go ahead and move on uh, to the next floor. Okay, now in this section what we're going to do is go ahead and uh, pick up where we left off and start building the other floors. We're going to work, work our way straight up. We're going to make the main bulk of the uh, body of this model. We're not going to worry about the little details quite yet. We'll, we'll finish that off later. Okay, but uh, what we want to do is go ahead and reuse. You notice the second floor is very similar to the first. So what we're going to do is reuse some of this geometry. Okay, we're just going to copy polygons and move them right up. Okay, first of all, we want to blow a hole out in the top there um, because we're going to have other polys sitting right on top of that. Okay, what I'm going to do is select polygons here for the bottom floor. I'm going to choose Move, and I'm going to hold down Shift on the keyboard and just move it right up. Anytime you Shift Move something in Max, okay, it copies it. We want to keep this as part of the same object as an element here, not to a new object, which was the top option there. Okay, after that, we're going to go ahead and uh, need to adjust the position of this a little bit. Okay, and so I'm just going to kind of eyeball stuff. We're going to have to fix this. Uh, obviously, the scale of these two floors is slightly different. Okay, so we'll go ahead and scale them a bit if necessary. Okay, but it's a really nice head start reusing that geometry rather than creating it all totally from scratch. Okay, so I'm just going to scale that in along the X, Y a bit. That's looking moderately close. It looks like the top of our floor is a little bit high. So I'm going to go ahead and move that down. Okay. Now I'm going to go ahead and just take a look at things. Uh, you'll see me frequently switching between uh, views here as I'm trying to get the scale of this uh, done. Remember, Alt-W will toggle you between the minimum and maximum. Okay, uh, I'm going to go ahead and scale this in a little bit, and chances are I'm going to need to switch to see-through mode, Alt-X once again, and really take a look at exactly uh, how big this area is in relationship to the reference image. Okay. I'm being a little indecisive here as I'm trying to uh, figure out how I want to attack this. I'm going to go ahead and just scale the polygons. I think will be safest. Okay, and that's looking pretty decent. We're pretty close. Okay, but technically there's uh, probably still a little gap in this area which we'll need to fix. Okay, so what I'm going to do is go ahead and uh, go to vertex sub-object mode. Okay, and use target welding. 
okay and I'm just gonna click on one vertex release and then click on the next one and it will snap one vertex to the next and condense those two vertices down into one okay when you're all done target welding just right click to discontinue that function it's a sticky button it likes to stay on so just watch out for that okay and it looks like uh, we're pretty darn close here okay looks like floor two is really close to done just gonna double check some stuff here okay and it looks like the height of this vertex may be off a hair okay so what I'm gonna go ahead and do is I'm gonna go ahead and select all these vertices here okay and I'm gonna actually use a uh, type in scale I'm gonna scale them vertically so they're smashed right on top of each other on the same plane okay you can do that by right clicking on the scale transform Okay, and I'm choosing non-uniform that'll allow me to access each axis axis separately I'm gonna type in zero and hit enter what that's gonna do is scale them all vertically so they're smashed down along the same uh, plane basically vertically okay take a look at things see how it's going and it looks like I might be a little bit off on the shape of that second floor the top of it's slightly different you'll see our reference image is is not perfectly symmetrical um, vertically okay and then I'm gonna go ahead and shift to move this guy up once again okay make another copy of it um, and I want to make sure that stays as an element of this object okay and we're gonna pretty much go through the same routine Okay, I'm going to go ahead and need to scale this thing probably a little bit. Okay, checking in the other view. You see I'm working in the top but looking in the front. Sometimes that's a good way to work when you're uh, checking the size of things. Okay, I'm resetting my layout by right clicking in that little junction area between the views. And once again here, we're going to have the same issue. Uh, you'll see that these vertices are not welded yet so I'm gonna go ahead and access target weld off my uh, quad menu okay notice I wor work off the quad menu quite extensively uh, which just really saves a lot of time because you can access a bunch of the key tools uh, really immediately so you're not hunting around over there in the command panel somewhere for them okay so that's looking pretty good once again I'm gonna double check the height of the vertices here Okay, I can also just do type ins. Okay, it's another way you can move uh, vertices to make sure they're on the same height. And I'm going to go ahead and just copy that vertical information from one vertex to the other ones. Make sure you hit enter to register it, and that will uh, adjust their height just slightly. You'll see these guys weren't too far off to begin with, but if for some reason you need to move a bunch of vertices uh, to a certain height, you can go ahead and do type ins at the sub object control as just as you could with an object as a whole okay uh, probably make a few more little adjustments here uh, don't want to affect the inner portions of that guy okay we just want to scale these guys in a bit and I'll just work my way up to the next row we could also do this in edge sub object mode it really doesn't matter too much but uh, working with vertices it's a little sometimes safer selecting things don't accidentally hit the wrong edges okay gonna go ahead and move these guys up scale them in a little bit yeah it's looking pretty close there and I'm gonna go ahead and plan for that next little uh, extruded area on the top okay and scale those guys in pretty close might be off a hair from our reference image but we're, we're pretty darn close which is uh, the main thing okay and it looks pretty good we're all set uh, we've just got a little problem we've got a little hole on the top I'm gonna to switch to border sub object mode here and then hit cap what that does is creates a polygon in that area for us 
Okay, we could have also went to polygon subobject mode manually chose to create a poly in that area, but um, Kappa worked just fine. Now I'm just going to go ahead and do little extrusions to get that little uh, that little ornamentation on the top all set. Okay, I'm not going to worry about the little rings yet that go around that. I'm just going to do the little pole that sticks out of the top. I'm going to use inset once again to get a little area um, that I can extrude from to get that that little rod going upward. Okay, and we'll get those little knobs on the top as well. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and do another extrude. Um, looks like we might have been a little wide there, so I'm scaling this down is what I was doing there. Okay, I'm going to get the height okay. And this time what I'm going to do is, because I need to do multiple extrusions here, I want to make sure and leave room for that geometry. I can just hit apply and what I'm going to do is just register each little extrusion separately. Okay, Basically when you have that settings dialog up, um, what it's doing is previewing the function for you and you can, can apply it and it'll preview the same function again if you want. Or you can just hit OK which will close out of the dialog. Okay, now I'm just making a few little adjustments to this pole to get it about the right width. And then we want to go ahead and extrude those little knobs out there again. Okay, so I'm going to once again using uh, polygon subobject mode. I'm going to go ahead and use that extrude settings button once again. And we want to do it local normal so they go all outward. Okay, get them about the right size. And hit OK. Mm, it's looking pretty good. Looks like we got the bulk of our work done. And we'll probably just be moving on to doing some of that ornamentation in a little bit. I'm just going to take a look at things and make sure everything looks all right. Okay, what we're going to be doing in this section is finishing up the model, doing a lot of detailing and uh, polish for the most part, which uh, actually takes quite a bit of time. Uh, what we're going to be doing is go ahead and start uh, pretty much from the ground up, and we want to get those uh, little window and door areas recessed. Okay, so uh, I'm just switching between my views using uh, F to switch to a front, P to perspective. Okay, and what we're going to go ahead and do is uh, we want an actual recessed doorway. So we're going to need to add in some additional geometry on the front. Selecting those two edges on the front, and I'm doing a little edge connect here. So that uh, we have uh, a little bit of extra geometry to work with. Okay, and we're going to also need to do some more edge connection um, going vertically so that uh, we have kind of subdivisions between the windows and the doors. So we're going to do a connect again. Okay, at this point, uh, we're going to need to make a few adjustments on the locations of exactly where these vertices are. Okay, I'm just going to kind of center these guys over uh, the area that they are going to be extruded from and scale them a bit. That's getting pretty close. Okay, now what we can go ahead and do, uh, I'm going to go ahead and turn on ignore back facing there. And that's going to prevent me from selecting through the object and, and select accidentally getting something on the back side. And I'm going to do a little negative extrusion here on the door. So that way we've got a little recessed doorway, which um, just going to add a little bit more uh, interest to the model if you get up close to it. We're going to also... Uh, do a negative extrusion on those little window areas um, and get those uh, inset. Okay. Okay. So basically I'm trying to establish the shape of those window areas and we want to go ahead and choose by polygon here. 
what that's going to do is do an inset separately from one another so they're not a, you know inset as a big group but rather individually and then we can go ahead and do an extrusion a little negative extrusion on these polygons as well okay so I'll go ahead and do a negative extrusion uh, maybe not quite as deep as the door but um, that's looking pretty good so I'm gonna go ahead and hit OK with that okay so you can use edge connect uh, extrusion for uh, any little recesses and and you know things like that that you need on your model okay now what we're gonna do is take a look at um, a few different things here uh, one is going to be the little uh, separate elements that we have like those little uh, portions on the edge of the uh, mesh and also we're gonna do any little fine-tuning that we need to it looks like uh, my platform in this area may be a little bit big so I'm gonna go ahead and scale that down just a hair we're also gonna worry about uh, how to make those little fences uh, that are going on the little platforms as well okay what we're gonna do is extrude edges up uh, to establish the shape of those little platforms okay if we try to do that here in editable poly okay this is considered an illegal modeling function it's considered an error error because uh, there's a poly coming straight out of another poly okay so it's getting a t-junction which uh, won't work at all I'm gonna just also show you something else uh, polygon counter which is you can find under the utilities panel under more and we're gonna go ahead and convert this object to editable mesh which is a triangular based modeling system it's a little bit older and you'll notice that the polygon counter now is counting a higher number of polygons because it's counting triangles and not squares Okay, but what Edit Mesh allows us to do is to do some of these illegal modeling function, functions that you may end up wanting to do intentionally. Okay, so what I'm going to do is go ahead and select all those edges uh, that are bordering the little edge of the platform there. Okay, and what we're going to go ahead and do is choose uh, Move. I'm going to hold down Shift and we're gonna move those guys straight up okay, and what that's gonna do is form that little fence area so we're getting kind of a little t-junction with our polys okay a little problem we might have right now is that some of these polygons are facing the wrong direction really they don't know what's in and what's out so I'm gonna go ahead and select any polys that are flipped uh, see they're facing inward they're invisible from the backside okay, I'm gonna select any ones that are facing the wrong way and then go ahead and flip them so they're all it's all consistent they're all facing outward which is what we want okay looks like we might have them all double check your selection scroll down here and uh, choose flip for the normals what normals are, are basically the display direction so that's gonna allow you to make sure that they're shown in the right direction and not be facing inward where uh, you know, it's really no point on them being facing that way. Okay. Uh, one thing we are going to consider is the fact that it is possible that maybe someone uh, could be overlooking this thing on a hilltop, and uh, once we get it in the game, and we've got a little problem because since the polygons are invisible from the backside, okay, we may not be able to see them. So what I'm going to do is actually duplicate these polygons. Okay, I'm just going to shift move them upward and then I'm going to end up flipping their normals so they're displaying inward so we've got a front side and a back side to the fence okay so I choose flip there and now we want to make sure they're sitting right on top of the other polygon so I'm gonna go ahead and activate my 3d snap and make sure uh, it's set to vertex do that by right clicking okay and I'm just gonna make sure they snap vert to vert so that the new polygons that I cloned are sitting right on top of the other ones are just facing inwards okay 
What I'm going to do now is go ahead and weld these guys. Okay. Because those new polygons are kind of free floating right on top of the other ones. Okay. For some game engines, this can be a no no, but uh, for the ones that I've been working on, it's acceptable to have uh, polygons sitting right on top of each other and be welded as long as they're facing opposite directions. This may depend on the engine you're using, uh, whether uh, that's acceptable or not. Okay, so now what we're going to do is I'm taking a look at these little rings that are going around the rod, coming right out of the top. Okay, and what we're going to do is just plan on, instead of building individual rings, we're going to just put one cylinder around that whole area, and then we're going to plan on using an opacity map, a transparency map, to make, make them invisible in certain portions. That's going to help save on our polygon count, and it's going to add a lot more detail. Okay. So what I'm going to do is just make a little cylinder in this area. Okay, and I've uh, checked auto grid. Okay, that basically allows me to start the creation of that object right on the other. And I'm going to go ahead and align this object to our main pagoda body so that it's dead centered right over the other thing. At this point, I can go ahead and affect its radius and its height to get it to be about the right size. And I can go ahead and convert it to editable mesh or editable poly, whichever I want. And I really don't need this polygon sitting right on top here. No one's going to be looking down there, so I'm going to go ahead and get rid of it. Okay, I'm also selecting that one on the bottom. Okay, I just did that by selecting all the polygons and holding out Alt and deselecting it. And we're going to go ahead and delete that polygon too. There's no point having a polygon, you know, s sitting right there where it's going to be hidden on top of the other one. So we might as well save the geometry budget and uh, get rid of it. Okay, now we're going to go ahead and uh, make these little bells here that are hanging off the, the corners of this object. Okay, and how I'm going to do that is similar to what I did with that little cylinder up top. I'm just going to create another object. Okay, and I'm going to use Auto Grid once again so I can just um, create this thing and not have it be flying off into space. I'm just going to go ahead and move this up and into position. Okay, roughly where that uh, it's at on the reference image. Okay, and I'm just going to go ahead and set the size for this little pyramid so it looks about right. Okay, I want it to be the same width and depth. Okay, so what I'm probably going to do here is go ahead and do a type in or do a copy paste to get these things to be the same size. Okay, so that way I know it's as wide as it is deep. Okay, now what I want to do is have this uh, little object here be perfectly placed right on the corner there. So I'm going to go ahead and activate my 3D snap in just a second here. It looks like uh, if you don't have your snaps, it can be a little uh, frustrating. Okay, and I also turned off my gizmo so it wouldn't accidentally restrict me going the wrong direction. Okay, I can turn off your gizmo by hitting X on your keyboard. Very helpful to do. Now I'm just shift moving these guys up using my 3D snap once again so that, see it snaps vertex to vertex. Okay, and I'm just cloning them as copies for now is a good option. Okay, once I've got all three of these guys all set, okay, I can go ahead and convert them to a mesh and then just attach the other three onto them. Okay, what this does is now all three of these little guys are considered one object. Okay, so I can just shift move the whole set of them over all at once. Okay, which just saves a little bit of time. I'm going to go ahead and turn on my angle snap to toggle, which allows me to rotate in five degree increments. Okay, and rotate them uh, around so that they're oriented properly and then just move them over into position once again using my 3D snap X on your keyboard once again to turn off that uh, the uh, 
move gizmo, which can kind of get in your way sometimes as you're working on this. Okay, and I'm going to copy them over the other side once again. Rotate them 180 degrees so they're facing the exact opposite direction. And go ahead and move them into place. Okay, looks pretty good. Can turn off my toggles right there. Not sure if I'll need them or not. And what I'm going to do is go ahead and click on attach and attach all those little guys. Okay, now they're all considered part of the original Pagoda object. Okay, now I'm going to go ahead and make uh, the little support beams on the underside there. I'm going to make those uh, just using a box. Okay, and we're going to go ahead and you know edit that a bit so that it is uh, a little more interesting. Okay, I'm just going to go ahead and rotate this uh, 45 degrees so that uh, it's angled out in the right direction. Okay, and I'm just going to eyeball this moving into place and adjust its length, width, and height to whatever I need it to be. Okay, now what I'm doing is I'm using the local coordinate system, which will allow me to move this object off of its own axis, not off of uh, a generic view space. And that's helpful for if I need to keep this on the same line, but just move it outward or inward. Okay, I can use uh, the local coordinate system for move and for rotate as I'm doing here. Okay, and that's going to allow me to rotate this thing based off of its own axis so it doesn't rotate at some odd angle that's based on the view. Okay, so I'm going to rotate it upward because you see that our little ceiling has kind of an upward slant. And once I've got it in position, I'm going to go ahead and convert to editable poly for a little bit of custom geometry editing. Using edge connect once again, extrusion once again. Uh, pretty much as we did for the main body of this thing. Okay. You'll notice that by default, if I try moving that polygon, it's going to go in any odd direction. I want to set that to parent. Whenever you're working at sub-object mode, you want it to move things uh, based off of their parent's orientation or the object as a whole's orientation. Choose parent under your reference coordinate system. That will allow you to uh, restrict that movement based off of uh, the main base object. Okay, looks pretty good. Alt-X once again to check uh, against the reference image in see-through mode. And now that we got this one beam made, I'm going to go ahead and switch to view coordinate system and move it straight up. Okay, move it as a copy is fine. Okay, so shift move once again to clone the object. Remember that worked for a sub object as well. And up, oh, we forgot to blow out wasted poly. See the, how the, those things were hidden anyways? Okay, all those little polygons were just kind of butted up against the side of our object. We might as well go ahead and get rid of those. It'll save us a little bit on our polygon budget. Best to do it now when we'll have one of these things and have to go around to each of them individually. Shift move it up as a copy. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and switch back to uh, local orientation for a coordinate system and go ahead and move that back locally and go ahead and shift move another up okay it's so pretty much the same routine notice the sides of our uh, our top roof section is a little bit different so um, we may have to butt this thing in a little bit more which may or may not be a problem depending on how your engine will handle uh, Z sorting issues. I'm going to go ahead and pull those verts 
out a bit just to make sure they're not too far dug in there. It really doesn't matter a lot of times for a lot of engines, but some engines get a little bit touchy when you uh, bring in objects that have uh, penetrating geometry and such. Uh, just double checking things here. Any little adjustments we need to make? Go ahead and do it now. And it's looking pretty good. I'm going to go ahead and attach all three of those, just as we did for the little pyramids earlier. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and uh, shift move them over. Okay, that's going to copy them. Rotate them around. And move them into position. Mm, pretty close there. Maybe just a hair more over. Yep, looks good. All right. Now that we got one of those done, let's go ahead and attach the others. Okay, now they're all just one big object. Even if they're not, they're not physically connect, connected, they're considered uh, the elements of all one mesh. Okay, let's go ahead and spin these around opposite direction, 180 degrees, using my angle snap once again. A is the hotkey for angle snap if you're using snaps a lot. A and S. S for a 3D snap toggle and A for angle snap. Okay, and I'm just going to go in a side view here and just make sure they're lined up about perfect with the other ones. And obviously a little too far out. And it's really close. That's looking pretty good there. So what I'm going to do is just choose a attach list and just select everything. And we should be all set. Looks pretty good. Okay, looks like the model is uh, pretty co close to completed. Okay, but we've got some weird faceting going on. Okay, and what that is is anytime you build custom geometry, uh, Max does not know how to make light blend over those new edges. Okay, so what we're going to do is go ahead and Go to Polygon Subobject Mode. Make sure Ignore Back Facing is not on. Okay. Select all the polys and then click on Auto Smooth. What Auto Smooth does is basically looks at a little angle threshold, which is right next to the Auto Smooth button, and says if an, a polygon is less than 45 degrees um, apart as far as its angle angling to its neighbors, then go ahead and make uh, the light blend smoothly over that area. Okay, that helps you get everything kind of in the ballpark, but usually you're going to have to customize things a little bit. Okay, I want a nice sharp edge between each of these uh, little quadrants here on the top of uh, our mesh. Okay, I want a nice linear subdivision. Okay, I want a hard edge between these polygons. Okay, so what I'm going to do is go ahead and select the ones I'm going to be playing with. Okay, I'm going to reassign them to a different smoothing group. Okay, what that does is basically says you guys have light blending evenly over your surface, but you're not going to blend with other polygons of a different smoothing group. Okay, so if you have two different smoothing groups right next to each other, light will not blend evenly over that junction area. Okay, so uh, Auto Smooth kind of got us in the right direction. Okay, it's kind of a generic solution. But we're going to go ahead and need to customize things a little bit. So we're going to select polygons and manually assign smoothing groups. 
Okay, really the number that you give the group is somewhat arbitrary. Okay, uh, you'll see me choosing a lot of different random numbers. And really all I'm trying to do is avoid them accidentally blending with uh, other neighboring polys, which by default usually get numbered a really low number, like one, two, three, four, five. So a lot of times I'll be uh, selecting polys. And then what I'll do is you can see some of these are set to two and some of them are set to three. You can tell that when the uh, little smoothing groups are blank. Okay, and what I'm doing is you just want to unregister those, so you just click on two, and then unclick on it, so that it uh, basically disengages that uh, smoothing group, and then go ahead and assign it to another one by clicking on some other number. Okay, these little polys uh, here on the fence area are going to be a little tricky because. Um, basically we've got polygons sitting right on top of each other facing different directions. So we'll need to uh, make sure, be really careful about our selections and make sure, making sure that the polygons on one side of the fence are set to a different smoothing group than the ones on the uh, opposing side. Okay, so we'll need to go in here and manually set a bunch of these. Okay, so I'm going to select these guys. I want the light to blend smoothly over their surface, but not with some other polys. So I'll set them to their own smoothing group. Okay, I want to release the old smoothing groups that are assigned to them. You can always tell if there's uh, a bad assignment in smoothing groups because you'll see a real harsh line sometimes when you shouldn't. That's usually a smoothing group issue. Okay, release those from 4 and 5 and go ahead and set them up to some higher number that is not being shared by other neighboring uh, polygons. Okay, so basically if, if you've uh, used Maya or another package, uh, what this is is just setting hard edge, soft edge uh, issues. So I'm going to be releasing these and then registering them to another value. Since we've got so many angles on this uh, model, it's it's going to take a little while, and um, it's also a little hard to see the shaded red faces. So I'm I'm just switching my objects color to blue, so it's a little easier for you guys to see this. Notice you know, smoothing groups gets a little tedious after a while, especially if you've got so many weird little angles like we've got, especially in this fence area, because uh, it's kind of a an odd little extruded area that uh, sometimes auto smooth has trouble figuring out properly. So once again, release them and re-register them to another group. A lot of artists really dread doing smoothing groups. <laughs> it, gets, it gets a little tedious after a while if you've got um, lots and lots of polygons to work with. If you've got a real organic shape, sometimes it's actually a little easier um, because you can basically use auto smooth and it'll get you really close. It'll just do a nice smooth curve over everything. You can actually adjust that auto smoothing value so that um, the angle threshold that's right next to it uh, is a little higher or lower to uh, basically s separate the polygons more into different smoothing groups or not. So this is a little hard-edged model that I've obviously got real specific ideas about how it should look. Um, it usually takes a little bit longer in setting up your smoothing groups. So in this case, uh, I've got all these little guys, uh, these little end caps, and I'm just setting them all to the same smoothing group. Since there's no physical connection between them, uh, that's perfectly fine to do uh, because they obviously can't blend to one another if they're not physically attached. Okay, so I'm just going to take a look at this. Um, 
looks like we're looking pretty good. Uh, by doing these smoothing groups, we're just affecting how that lighting is blending over different edges. Some game engines will read this, some won't. Um, it may depend on exactly what you're exporting to. Okay, in this section what we're going to be doing is uh, assigning mapping coordinates. Uh, mapping coordinates are basically what controls how the texture is going to be projected onto this object. We're going to be doing this using uh, Unwrap UVW, but first of all we want to fire up the material editor and go ahead and get a little uh, useful material. Uh, you can use a checker. I've got kind of a custom checker pattern I'm using. Um, that'll help us to check uh, our alignment of uh, exactly how these, you know, a, a real texture would be projected onto the thing. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and assign that um, show map in viewport. I'm going to go ahead and increase my tiling on this map to uh, just any fair amount. You can go 10 by 10 or 30 by 30 or whatever looks good to you. Um, depending on how big the object, you may want to go bigger or not. Okay, as you can see now, uh, since this object is mostly custom created geometry, um, you'll see that it's not showing up very well at all. And that's because there's no mapping coordinates on this object. So we're going to go ahead and assign them using unwrap UVW modifier. Okay, and um, once we get this on there, I'm going to go ahead and uh, start doing some kind of custom editing using the edit window. Okay, and basically what we're seeing is kind of a, a little wireframe template showing how the object is uh, getting a texture projected onto it. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and make a few little adjustments here before we start anything. I'm going to hit show options. Okay, uh, a few things that bug me. I'm going to go ahead and uh, increase the size of uh, the overall texture map. I'm also going to uncheck tile. I don't like seeing that tiling because this isn't... Uh, like a terrain texture or something that would be tiling. I'm also going to go to the advanced options um, and I'm going to uncheck show grid. That's just going to get in my way as I'm working. And whoops, I forgot to OK that. So uh, I want to uncheck show grid. And then make sure I hit OK to register that or it won't stick. And uh, that just gives us a little bit of a cleaner window to work in. Uh, it's not absolutely necessary you do those options, but Okay, now uh, I've activated select face sub-object mode, and you can see that if I select points in the edit window, it syncs up to the viewport and vice versa. What we're going to do is go ahead and um, just kind of rearrange these using an automated technique called flatten mapping. Okay, what that does is basically going to break out all the polygons based off of a planar angle threshold. Okay, uh, kind of like what we were doing with smoothing groups a little bit earlier in auto smooth. Okay, I'm just going to leave everything set to defaults and hit OK. What that's going to do is just break the polygons out into a little flat projection for any kind of flat areas that are all uh, facing the same direction. Okay, that's not going to be our finished product. Okay, that's just a, a starting point. Okay, and we're actually going to end up remapping a lot of this. So I'm just going to move those points off to the side. And then I'm going to go ahead and go in here and start actually remapping stuff manually. Okay, so the automated technique sometimes will give you a nice start, but generally you're going to need to uh, go in here manually. And what I'm going to do is planar map these guys. Okay, so I select the polygons and I click planar map. Okay, over in the modify panel and then that's going to just cause a planar projection over them. Okay, After that basically it's kind of like making your own little jigsaw puzzle. I want to go ahead and move these uh, points around to wherever I want them located. I'm using the freeform gizmo can see positioning your uh, mouse inside of the little bounding area will allow you to move it. 
you don't want to work off that middle point. What that is is kind of like a pivot point. Okay, so you, whenever you're uh, doing that, you want to move these guys. Just kind of work in the blank area in the middle of the boundaries. If you work off the corners, that'll activate scale. And if you work off the sides of that bounding area, uh, that will activate rotate. Okay, so what I'm doing here is selecting another polygon, clicking the planar map once again, and scaling it down. That's that little overhang uh, just under the edge of that guy. Okay, what I'm doing is I'm just going to try to scale these UVs so that they're about the same size as that little beam that's just above them. Okay, that way I'm getting a uniform pixel density over this area. Okay, um, it's not vital to always have uniform pixel density, and that basically means that they're getting about the same amount of texture map space relatively to how big they are in uh, the viewport. But um, I'm going to go ahead and just keep everything fairly uniform here. And I'm going to go ahead and rotate that over to flip it. Okay. If you hold down um, a couple hotkeys, you can restrict that rotation and that movement. Okay. If you hold down uh, shift, it'll restrict the movement to one axis. Control will uh, allow you to do pretty much a uniform or uh, an angle snap rotation. Okay, so what I want to do is go ahead and map all areas of this model that are unique. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and detach that little area of the uh, mesh that is basically like the walkway area right in front of the door. Okay. And you can see that that's going to be pretty much the same, like all the little uh, beams and the, the platform that you're going to be walking on will be the same on each side. So I'm not going to worry about mapping the other sides as well. I'm just going to do unique areas. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and scale that, get it in position. And then I'm going to go ahead and map uh, the whole front side of this thing. And I'm going to go ahead and just do the doors, the windows, pretty much everything there. I'm just control clicking to add to my selection there. Okay, once again I'm going to use planar map. Okay. I can affect which axis it's being mapped from. Okay, I could choose uh, just an averaged amount. I could also choose to planar map it from the X direction or the Y direction or the Z direction. Okay, in this case, I want to just hit it head on. And I'm going to hit planar map once again. Okay, I'm holding down control and scaling that down so that'll do a uniform scale. Okay. Work from the corners once again to scale. Go in the middle to move. Control restrict my scaling to uh, uniform. If I hold down shift, it would restrict it to just a vertical or horizontal scaling. You'll notice that it looks like uh, these UVs are flipped the wrong direction. So what I can do is go ahead and click this little mirror horizontal option. You'll see that now check my numbers are reading in the right direction. Okay, This is why I use this little uh, checkerboard pattern that I use. Um, it just makes it a little easier to see if things are facing the right direction. If you're working on some building that has some text on it, it's like a you know a modern building with a sign on it. You don't want the text reading the wrong direction. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and planar map the underside of the sky again. Okay, pretty much the same routine here. See, as I'm working through UVing most of this, uh, a lot of this gets pretty repetitive. Uh, a lot of artists really dread doing UVs, but uh, Max has got some pretty nice tools that allow you to uh, speed things up a little bit. And basically I want to get all this stuff fitting on the page as tightly as I can. 
So it's kind of like doing a little jigsaw puzzle and, and getting it all squished in there in the right area. You want to basically use as much of that area as you can, okay? Because that's going to be our texture map, and there's no point in having big blank areas, okay? We really want to try squeezing stuff on there. Okay, we can go ahead and map the top of this guy. Hit it with a planar map as well. I might adjust my axis to uh, average normals, or uh, if I want to just go off the z-axis vertically straight down map it, I can do that. Okay, just hit the little toggle there that says X, Y, Z, or average normals. And you can see these are all split up by that earlier flatten mapping we did. But once we hit the planar map, they are remapped and are all now one contiguous element of uh, UV mesh. Okay, and once again, I'm just checking the scale. I know that thing butts right up against the underside, so I'm just going to make sure they're about the same size. Uh, consistent pixel density okay. also can help me to avoid seams if I uh, see these things uh, right up against each other. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and select all the polys uh, for that little fence on the front side and the back side. I want to map that kind of coming from the front head on. Okay, so I'm going to hit that with a planar map as well. I use planar map quite extensively. Um, it is possible to just go with that flatten and then kind of move stuff around and adjust it, um, but uh, it's pretty much your personal preference. I, I'm, I'm kind of a control freak, so I end up uh, remapping stuff quite a bit. I like doing it myself a little bit better. Okay, make sure the uh, numbers are going the right directions. There we go. Looks pretty good. And okay, that portion of the mesh is a little bit different from the base, so we're going to go ahead and map that. That's a unique portion of mesh, so we're going to be mapping that as well. Okay, I know that butts up against the uh, platform base, which is right there. So I can go ahead and scale it and take a look at the size of things. You know, to see that little blue line on the platform? Basically, that's just flagging the area that it butts up against. Okay. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and stack these floors right over uh, each other, and that's just going to uh, make it a little bit easier for me as I'm painting to kind of visualize what's going on. Obviously, since the platform got mapped from a different angle, um, it's going to be uh, facing a different direction. I can't really hit that from uh, the front side. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and readjust this fence. Okay, it looks like its size was actually off a little bit. Okay, we've got a little checkbox down there that says select element in the edit window. And anytime you have that checked, it basically is going to uh, allow you to just select one uh, UV ver vertex and anything that's physically connected to it will be selected. So it just makes it nice when you're snagging stuff and moving it around to uh, quickly get things going. Okay, so uh, now what we're going to be doing is taking a look at some different portions of the mesh considering what else is unique, what we're going to need to be mapping. Okay, that side of the mesh, uh, it's probably going to be a little bit different from both the front and the uh, upper floor. So uh, we're going to go ahead and smack that with a planar map as well. Okay, control over a corner to scale it down. Okay, it looks like the numbers are flipped the wrong way. We'll flip that. Okay, we know that it's the same size uh, as the front side, because remember that originally was a box object. Okay, so I'm just using the uh, other UVs as a kind of a template to build from. I'm just going to move it up above the other guys. Um, I may rearrange these UV chunks quite a bit as we get moving a little further on. So now I'm just going to look at any other portions of the mesh. You can see that uh, a lot of this stuff is going to be redundant. You can see that the 
little platform at the base uh, will be the same on, as it is on the front as it is on the side so I'm not going to worry about remapping that stuff but I will worry about stuff like the insides of the doorway okay um, those are going to be a little bit different so I'm going to go ahead and map those insides of the windows I'm going to go ahead and map those Okay, I probably won't need to map all the windows because if as soon as I get one mapped, I can basically um, use that information over again. Looks like I was mapping all of them here, or at least two of them for the moment. Okay, once you get those mapped, you can see if you just hit a little chunk of the mesh with a planar map sometimes it scales it to a to fit over that whole area okay so you may need to kind of uh, resize it pretty substantially I'm just going to line up these little chunks I mean these are just going to be um, like little, little wood shutter area pieces and I'm just gonna go ahead and smash them in as, as tight as I can get them. Uh, I'm not too worried about when I paint my textures if it bleeds over the edge because all those little chunks are going to be painted a, a fairly consistent color. Okay so now I just want to go ahead and scale these guys down. Okay I'm just gonna do that right over the windows themselves, the window UVs. Scale them lengthwise so that they're about the same length and find a nice little blank area that I can move these guys off to. Uh, that'll work fine. Okay, looks like I uh, go ahead and hit on the doorway. And I'll probably uh, go ahead and pull that off to the side just for a minute. Get it all adjusted. Oops, forgot the bottom. Need to go ahead and map the bottom. Okay, there's like a little uh, doorstep area where you're coming into the door. Okay, similar technique to the windows. Uh, pretty much just stack them up. Since those guys are sitting right on top of each other, I might need to pull them off a little bit. Okay, notice I'm selecting stuff. I may alternate. I mean, I may may end up selecting uh, these polys either by selecting the UV verts in the edit window, or I may be doing it in the uh, actual viewport window. And since I've got select face sub object mode on, they do sync up just fine. Let's tighten these guys up as close as I can get them. Okay. Remember, I've got select element mode uh, on down there in the bottom of the edit window. That little checkbox allows me to just select uh, any verts I have, and it'll select the entire element of uh, UV points that are physically connected. Okay, go ahead and size that so it's about the same size as the doorway, and smash it in there. So it's kind of like making a little jigsaw puzzle, basically. You just uh, try to figure out where these little uh, portions of mesh will uh, fit in best and just pack them as tight as you can get them. There are some automated functions um, for packing UVs in the edit window, in the, uh, edit window but um, I don't always find it, it works the best. Sometimes they're a good start, but um, a lot of times I end up just doing a lot of stuff manually anyways. It looks like the scale of that was off a little bit. And see that checker? I'm using that checker reference uh, to help me out and make sure I get uniform pixel density for those uh, areas. Okay, 
and basically the undersides of the roof are going to be the same the whole way up so I'm not going to worry about redoing all this mapping and everything for the uh, undersides of the roof ditto for the fence okay. the only thing I really need to worry about is mapping other unique areas um, so I'm just going to have to take a look at exactly which portions of the mesh are unique uh, go ahead and give them mapping coordinates and then I can just basically if there's a, a similar portion of mesh such as uh, the little support beams okay, I can just put the UVs right over the top of one another I may even be able to copy and paste those UVs as it works <clears throat> okay, I'm gonna select all these uh, polygons here for this little support beam okay, and you can see they're all broken up what I'm gonna do is go ahead and do a little mapping option automat automated mapping called unfold and what that does is basically tries to split the polygons up uh, but not off of a generic planar threshold it tries to maintain a connection where there should be one okay what I'm doing is I'm gonna go ahead and detach those okay, okay you can choose detach edge vertices to break those guys free so that I can reorient them without messing up the other verts okay I'll go ahead and just uh, get in there real tight pack them together okay go ahead and adjust their size as necessary okay, and I'm taking a look at the um, size of the checkers on that uh, little portion of mesh in relationship to the uh, size of the checkers on that underside of the roof okay go ahead and scale those guys down it's looking pretty good little bells on the corner I think I'll go ahead and do a mapping uh, go ahead and try a normal mapping this time just to demonstrate this to you okay and I'm choosing box mapping what that does is well, gave me not too good of uh, results, so I'm going to go ahead and switch it to flatten. Uh, it depends on what you want to use uh, for those automated mapping techniques. Uh, sometimes it's a little bit of trial and error. Uh, basically, flatten mapping just automatically breaks them apart uh, based off of a generic planar threshold. Okay, um, the next option down allows you to map it like a box map or a uh, diamond map, various other kind of generic um, solutions that kind of break it apart. And then you got normal mapping, which tries to just kind of split the polygons apart uh, where necessary, but maintain the integrity of the uh, entire UV chunk. Okay, it looks like uh, since the top of this thing will be. Uh, it's going to be receiving light a little bit differently than those uh, other portions under the overhang. So I'm going to go ahead and planar map that and go ahead and uh, scale that down, get the size set. I'm going to switch to a different view, a user view, and this basically takes the perspective out of things, which can be a little bit helpful as I'm trying to check the scale of UVs because um, basically with the perspective view you've got that aspect of depth of things that are further away looking smaller okay which can kind of throw you off when you're trying to check pixel density using this little checker map I've got so sometimes I will switch to a user view just for doing stuff like that looks pretty good I'm gonna go ahead and map that little box on the top Okay, once again, planar map. Scale it down, scale it down, move it around. Continue my little jigsaw puzzle on how to fit as many of these UV chunks in as tightly as possible in this area. Chances are I'll rearrange stuff quite a bit in the future as we keep working. Planar map the top. Okay, 
Yeah, angle it like that. It'll fit in a little tighter. That works fine. And I'm going to go ahead and do this whole little section all the way around, I think. So, select face mode, select all those polys. Okay, I'll probably use a little automated solution for this guy. I'll go ahead and try unfold so it, it tries to uh, keep them all together as one big UV chunk. And it's being a little touchy right now. Okay, notice down in the bottom of the edit window, you do have a few different selection options. You can switch between vertex, edge, and poly sub-object mode. And it looks like for whatever reason it had a hard time mapping that one polygon. So I'm going to manually go in there and hit it with a planar map. And go ahead and uh, just butt this thing right up against the other guys. Okay, and now uh, what I want to do for just to make sure things stay together is there's go ahead and weld those vertices so we can weld uh, vertices here and uh, unwrap just as we can in uh, when we're modeling okay and I'm gonna go ahead and use a target weld option here okay I tried uh, regular welding but uh, apparently the vertices weren't close enough together to weld so sometimes going in there and using target weld uh, can be a little more accurate because you can manually make it stick to another vertex. And sometimes when I'm welding stuff, um, I will access a lot of this off the quad menu. Okay, remember the quad menu is context sensitive, and when we're working in the edit men, uh, the edit UV window here, um, a lot of the tools and options you're going to see in the quad menu will be specific to the edit UV window. Okay, got a few more little chunks here I need to go ahead and get mapped. Okay, these are all unique, so I want to make sure they get their uh, own mapping coordinates. Okay, what I'm doing is just going ahead and choosing detach edge vertices. What that does is just breaks those guys free from whatever they're uh, attached to. Then I can just go ahead and manu manually go in there and move them around. So as I was saying earlier, um, you can use the uh, automated mapping to get you started. And some people don't like hitting that planar map button a lot like I do. And what they'll do is actually just go in there and select different chunks of UVs. And if they need to break it free, they'll go ahead, instead of hitting planar map, they'll just hit detach. And then they'll go ahead and move it around, scale it, put it where they want it. And then they'll go ahead and detach other polys. And if necessary, weld them back together to other different chunks. That works just fine, too. Uh, I use a bit of both. Okay, so it looks like we're all set. All our unique portions of our mesh are uh, coming pretty close to done. So what we're going to want to... Uh, start thinking about doing is instead of completely remapping um, the other different chunks is we'll actually end up just overlapping their UVs right over the tops of the other one. Okay, so uh, before we do that we'll need to finish this guy off. What we need to do is we want to make sure we're utilizing as much of this map space as possible. Okay, so here's where my jigsaw puzzle starts really taking shape. I want to arrange these guys so that they're utilizing the most texture space they possibly can. So it's going to be a lot of shifting and rearranging. Since this guy is such an odd shape, this pagoda building, it's not like a standard generic uh, prefab kind of building. Um, we've got a lot of different angles and we've got a lot of big UV chunks which is going to make it a real challenge to get everything to fit on there just perfectly. So uh, it may take quite a bit of adjustment. Okay, I could go ahead and use uh, some of the automated. There's an automated packing function if I wanted to, but uh, I kind of want to align these things manually just because it really gives me a little bit more control. And also, I, I kind of like 
manually doing things so I know which UV chunks correspond to which portions of the mesh. Okay, and that's going to help me as I want to go in and paint my textures later. Uh, I'm not going to have to worry about figuring out what something is. I'll uh, already know that. Okay, so I'm just trying to figure out how I want to fit all this stuff on there. Looks like doing a little bit of engineering. And that may work. Let's try that. And looks like I may have to scale these guys down just a hair to be able to get everything else on there. You notice I did scale some portions of the mesh, uh, the UV mesh, without scaling the other, so it is a little bit inconsistent in the pixel density, but it's not a huge concern. Uh, I mean, they're relatively close. Maybe there's a 5% difference or something like that, but um, it really shouldn't be noticeable in the fact that you know one portion of the mesh will be horribly blurry because it gets no pixels and the other gets a lot. Okay, but this looks like probably about the best I'm going to get. Okay, I've just got the difficulties of that darn roof is such an odd shape. Um, square areas are much easier to deal with than those uh, difficult little triangular edges and such. So, uh, that's looking pretty good. Okay, that's the fence area, and that will need some opacity later on. So what I'm going to do is go ahead and give it a little more space. What that's going to do is where there's transparency, it's going to uh, have a few more pixels to calculate that from. So it's just going to give us a little bit cleaner of an area. And ditto for that uh, the top little rings that we're going to have around that. Okay, as we saw in the reference image earlier. So I'm just giving them a little more pixel density than the rest, and that's going to help with the uh, transparency and being a little more accurate. Okay, just double checking everything, making sure I didn't miss any unique areas that need mapping. Okay, looks like a lot of these are going to be the same: sides of the fence, sides of the sides of the pagoda. UVA layout's looking pretty good. Okay, so what we want to do now is go ahead and save these UVs. Okay, and basically what that allows us to do is, if ever we need to get to, back to this uh, little layout where there's no overlaps in the UVs, we can do that. Could come in helpful as we're doing uh, light baking later. Okay, it's never a bad idea to save your UVs. Just remember if you actually go in and modify the geometry heavily, okay, that's going to affect the UV layout. So uh, just want to plan for that ahead of time. Okay, in this next section here, um, we're going to be doing some more UVing. We're going to be picking up where we left off and um, actually just copying a lot of this UV information uh, from one side of the object to another. Uh, you can see a lot of this stuff's quite redundant. Uh, so once again, I'm going to make sure Select Face Sub-Object Mode is on. Okay, and I'm just going to go ahead and select those polygons that um, are already UV mapped and paste them to uh, other polygons that are the same shape and dimensions. Okay, so I'm going to hit Edit Copy from the uh, Edit window. Then I'm going to go ahead and select the other poly polys, and I'm going to go ahead and use Edit Paste Weld. And what that's going to do is make sure the UV points for this new portion of the mesh are smashed down right on top of the other one. So that way I don't have um, 
you know, 10 or 20 UV points. It's basically they're getting welded right on top of the other ones. Uh, this can be helpful for some game engines. They actually care about um, how many UV points you have. Uh, some engines it really doesn't matter too much on. So we've got the sides done there pretty well. Um, I'm going to go ahead and try copying and pasting this uh, to the other side, but you'll notice that we've got a little bit of a problem here because the geometry from the front side is actually a little different than that on the side. Okay, it's the same general shape, but you'll notice it doesn't paste weld in there very well. Okay, and the reason for that is that the geometry for that little platform on the front side of the door uh, actually butts up against the bottom of the door frame, so it has a different number of points on it. So what we had to do instead was go ahead and just use our planar mapping function as we were originally doing with our uh, mesh. So just select the polygons, go ahead and planar map it, and then I'm using the freeform gizmo here just to go ahead and scale this thing down, move it into position right over the other ones. Okay. After this, if we want to keep things uh, tightened up, what we can do is go ahead and weld these points on the corner at least, and that will reduce our number of texture vertices, okay, which uh, can be important to some game engines. It's just an extra bit of calculation that uh, your game engine may have to do. So I just activate target weld and then just click and drag one point to the other. We're going to have a little bit of a, a few points that won't be welded because that, remember that front side butts up against the door frame. So there's actually some subdivision in the geometry there. Okay, but now that we've got the side of floor mapped, we can go ahead and copy and paste that to the other sides. And that looks like that worked out pretty darn well. Okay, so uh, I'm going to take a look at the side here. Um, and start mapping this. And we've got the same issue here. You notice that the front of this thing connects to the side and the back okay, pretty much only has four vertices on the corners. So we're not going to be able to copy paste that one again. We'll go ahead and have to hit the planar map button once again. And then manually just go ahead and scale it down. Because remember that uh, other side um, we're working on the back right now, but the side butts up against the front. And it had been, remember, we used the edge connect there. So there's the geometry is actually uh, cut up a little bit. So we're going to go ahead and just, once again, um, use target weld. Notice you can access that off the quad menu when you're working in the edit window. Okay, the edit UV window. And um, that way uh, you can just access stuff real quickly. You notice doing some of this UV stuff gets uh, quite repetitive after a while, um, and so it's just generally a good idea to hotkey whatever you possibly can. Okay. Also, uh, remember if if you want to see which faces you have selected, F2 on your keyboard will shade selected faces in red. Sometimes it's a little difficult to see things, so I will toggle that off occasionally. Okay, so just lining up the other side here. Uh, go ahead and target weld in a second once we get it pretty close. Oh, looks like our numbers are backwards, so let's go ahead and hit the mirror horizontal from the edit UV window uh, toolbar. Okay, and we can also do a weld selected sometimes that will work. Um, sometimes if our UVs are a little bit out of position it won't work very well, so I'm going to go ahead and go back and use target weld at this point. Um, it's really a precise way to do it. If you want a quick down and dirty way you can select some UV points and just hit weld, uh, the weld selected. Sometimes that'll work just fine but um, if you need a little more precision uh, target welding sometimes is a better idea. Whenever you need to uh, discontinue that target weld function it's a sticky button it needs to stay on just right click that will activate uh, freeform mode by default. Okay, so uh, now I'm going to go ahead and have to select the underside here. Okay, I'm going to do an edit copy once again. Select the corresponding similar polygons, edit paste weld. And it looks like one of those, I either missed it or it's not working too well. Sometimes if you really hack into your geometry a bunch, um, you actually move some points around and then rebuild them you won't be able to copy and paste UVs. Uh, basically, it works really well if you worked off of a 
pure box extrusion with no modifications. If you extrude uh, four sides of a box upward, those four sides can be copy pasted quite well. But if you go in there and you move some vertices around, you cut into some things, you weld some vertices while you're modeling, um, it won't always copy paste uh, the uh, corresponding UV points uh, quite as well because basically you've reordered uh, the vertex numbers. So in those cases, you're pretty much going to have to go back to uh, the planar mapping. Um, you could also go up to uh, and use some of the automated uh, unwrapping techniques as well. Yep, so now that I got that side all set, I'm going to go ahead and copy that. And I'm hitting F2 to double check here uh, which polys are selected just to shade them quickly. But it's a little difficult sometimes to see things when you're uh, selecting them and trying to figure out what you have selected. So uh, I'll frequently be hitting, turning on and off F2 just to double check what I have selected and then to make sure I uh, select the correct polygons to be remapped in the future. Just a little bit of trivia. Um, I, I like running an edged face mode here and you'll see that uh, when I do that and I hit F2, uh, it will f uh, shade the polygons uh, solid red. If you're just running a, a standard smooth and highlights shaded mode, um, you will actually see a, like a red overlay over the uh, texture of the thing. So it's it's kind of nice. I, I alternate between the two quite a bit. Okay, so I'm just kind of taking a look at here what else I needed to do. Uh, we'll go ahead and copy and paste Okay, that entire uh, top section of that roof there, including the little walkway uh, behind the fence. Go ahead and copy, paste, weld, copy, paste, weld. And you'll see this does get fairly repetitive, so um, you can go ahead and hotkey a lot of this stuff. Uh, I'll probably do it the hard way here for you guys most of the time so you can see things a little easier. Uh, what I actually do sometimes when I'm at work though is I'll actually go into my, uh, in the main Max interface, go into the Customize menu and set up my quad menus. Uh, I, I go ahead and customize though and add other functions in, which is a possibility. And I'll add buttons in like planar map and stuff like that so I don't have to keep going over to the right side of my screen. Copy, paste, weld, copy, paste, weld. Um, see why a lot of artists really dread doing UV work because uh, especially when you get a games the way they're getting now in that uh, you know we're no longer working on you know 50 polygon buildings which were uh, a real breeze to get done we're actually working on buildings that may be you know 300 500 a thousand sometimes multiple thousands of polygons uh, it gets to be quite a bit more work when you're doing your UV mapping So I'm just copy paste welding, looking pretty good. Let's go ahead and hit the uh, sides of this second level. And I get flying here pretty quick uh, and this video is accelerated slightly so uh, uh, hopefully we won't have to drag you through copy paste weld uh, a zillion times at uh, a very moderate pace. but. Doing a lot of UVs like this will get you really quick with uh, a lot of your functions and also make you appreciate the uh, importance of hotkeying things whenever you can. And we're looking pretty good here. Okay, it looks like we've got the bulk of our body done. Now we're going to have to hit up uh, these little areas of the fence. Okay, since these in all this fence area, we've got two polys, or actually four polygons, four triangles sitting right on top of each other. Uh, sometimes it can be a little tricky getting the selection, so you want to be real careful with this. Also, you'll notice that there's um, this is a triangulated mesh now that we switched to uh, editable mesh. 
and sometimes if your triangles are facing in opposite directions of the ones next to that and below it um, the copy paste might not work too well like in that case right there see I tried to uh, paste well that guy and it didn't work too well so what I'm gonna do is just smack it with a planar map once again and then I'm just gonna go ahead and manually align those UVs right over the top of the other one so I'm gonna use that freeform gizmo uh, go ahead and move it over by putting my mouse inside the middle of the gizmo and then I'll go ahead and scale this thing down okay remember control will restrict your scaling in UV points uh, to a uniform scaling shift right there which is what I just used will restrict it to just a horizontal or just a vertical scaling okay so I'm gonna go ahead and try welding those UVs Okay, notice I did that off my quad menu, which um, speeds things up a little bit. So I'm going to go ahead and do these fence areas. Uh, uh, they're going to be probably the one of the trickiest areas to get done right. And it looks like that some of them are going to paste weld fine. Some I'll probably need to manually go in and replanar map it by hand, which is fine. Oop, that one came out bad. Let's go ahead and hit the planar map button for that one. Once again, as I'm uh, moving around here, uh, I'm hotkeying all my dis my uh, viewport display controls. Okay, uh, instead of going down to the bottom right hand corner and using the viewport controls uh, as I move around my scene I am using my middle mouse button very extensively just a plain middle mouse is pan okay if you use alt middle mouse that will uh, allow you to arc rotate around your object and uh, if you need to zoom in and out you can just roll the wheel if you don't have a wheel you can use control alt middle mouse So as you're doing these UVs like this, uh, you're kind of working in two windows at the same time. A lot of times you see I'll go in and select in the perspective or a user view, and then I'll end up going over and editing things in the uh, edit UV window. Okay, so uh, navigating around gets pretty important and kind of knowing what's going on on kind of both sides of the screen gets to be uh, pretty vital when you're doing this. And we're hitting a good little stretch here. All these are paste welding quite well, so that's nice. Going to save us a little bit of time. Eh. Of course, when I say that, then we hit a bad one. So that was the planar map button there again. That's what that was. Um, as you're hitting that planar map button, you might want to, like in this case, it's pretty much just a flat polygon uh, or two two triangles. And you can generally just hit that average normals and it'll hit them flat on. But if for some reason you need to hit some polygons from a particular angle f when you planar map them, you may want to go ahead and, and restrict that uh, projection from the X, Y, or Z direction. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and uh, weld these guys. Okay. When you're welding um, or you want to select a bunch of UVs in a big chunk at once, um, in the kind of the bottom portion of the edit UV window, um, you will see that there is a button uh, for uh, selecting the element, the entire chunk you can just check that checkbox and sometimes it makes it a little easier than going in there and manually trying to dra drag around points when your uh, UV layout gets a little bit cluttered and looking pretty good just working our way up to the top okay I want to see what I have mapped so uh, I'll go ahead and click on those things I'll go ahead and work my way around to the other side in reality, little little tiny chunks of, of geometry like this, I mean, this is going to be pretty small uh, 
when when the player's looking on it, it it's not a real huge concern you just basically want to get it the right color unless a player can walk right on up to something like this which in this case it's the top of a building so that's pretty highly unlikely unless uh, for some reason they could drop down to the top of this thing off a cliff or something like that um, I'm, I'm being a little nitpicky here you probably don't need to take it this far and get these things exactly right like this um, so just bear with me here as I'm uh, nitpicking this little area Okay. That looks good. So what I'll do a lot of times here, if I have see some stray UVs floating around the side there, go ahead and just click and drag around them and see what lights up in red. And it looks like I missed a window down there. So I'll want to go ahead and uh, copy paste. I could probably copy paste this window here at the bottom, this window frame area uh, over the other bit. So I'll go ahead and give that a shot and see if it works. If not, I may have to do it manually. We'll just take a look and see how it works out. Looks like it came out pretty well. And it looks like I only did one of the windows, so we'll have to go back and hit all of them up. And since, remember, we did those inset extrusions, insets and the extrusions all at the same time from the same mass, um, copying and pasting between them should work just fine because they were all working off of uh, the same initial creation action. If we had manually went in and cut those things I probably couldn't have uh, copied and pasted them quite so well. Okay, In reality the bottom of this thing um, some game engines really don't care if you actually just deleted that whole polygon left a hole on the bottom um, and that would be a pretty normal thing to do for a lot of game engines, but I'm just going to go ahead and keep this thing closed off for now. Um, I could go back in there in my mesh and delete it, but I'm not going to worry about it too much right at this moment. Okay, yeah, once you get your UVs all laid out, um, I'm going ahead and copying and pasting, uh, Okay, I, I turned on select by element. Okay, you'll see that in the command panel. There's a checkbox for select by element. That'll let you select uh, contiguous pieces of uh, mesh. And I'm just doing paste welds on them. If, um, as you work and you lay out your UVs, if you get a bunch of UVs set so they're perfectly right, but you know you're going to be working right around them very closely, and you're a little worried that you might accidentally mess them up, it is possible to go in and actually freeze your UVs, which basically locks them down in space. And you can do that by just clicking and dragging around them in the uh, edit window. I'm not going to do that right now, but I'm just letting you guys know. If you go in the edit UV window and you click and drag around some UV points that you're happy with, if you just right click from the uh, upper portion of the quad menu, you can go ahead and choose freeze selected and that'll freeze those points down okay I'm gonna go ahead and copy paste these uh, support beams Okay, make sure I get all the poly selected just double check paste weld And these are working pretty smooth because remember uh, we we just cloned all these things over. And we're getting to be in the home stretch now. Now I can start getting excited about doing some texturing pretty quick here. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and just blaze through this, uh, get these guys paste welded in. 
And then uh, I'm going to check for any little free-floating bits and see, uh, you notice I've got a little bit off the side of the edit UV window. I'm switching to wireframe by hitting F3 on my keyboard. And I just want to locate where this little problem, oh, looks like I missed one little polygon right up on the underside of that thing. So I will go ahead and uh, select that poly and do a paste weld on it. And looks like I'm all set. Nothing free floating. Uh, looks good. Yep. I'm looking all right. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and save this UV layout. I'm saving uh, this is the one where we're actually overlapping things. Okay, and I like keeping an a non-overlapped one where there's no overlapping and then an overlap version. This is going to help us out later on when we're uh, texturing and actually baking some lights into our scene. We'll talk more about exactly why you need to be concerned about that when we come up to it. But it's really not a bad idea to do. Okay, we're all ready to texture, so we'll move, be moving on to that um, in a moment. Okay, now uh, what we're going to be talking about is taking a look at that UV template we got laid out. Uh, we got all our UVs set up on this guy, and what we want to do is go ahead and export that information um, to Photoshop so that we can go ahead and do a paint over on this. Uh, basically what this thing is is our, our perfect layout. This is exactly how the textures are going to lie on here. And we're going to go ahead and use Alt Print Screen for this guy. I'm going to go ahead and go into Photoshop, do File New. Okay, and by default, it's going to be the same size as that active window, that active edit UV. And edit paste this information in here. And you can see uh, it gives us a perfect copy of our UV layout. At this point, what we're going to need to do is actually crop this thing down. So I'll use the Crop tool. And I'm going to go ahead and just uh, click and drag. Okay, and we want it just over that visible uh, texture area, not the actual blue and gray lines in the window. We don't need any of that panning up here using a uh, space bar. Okay, and once I'm satisfied, I can right click and choose crop. Okay, it'll crop the image. Uh, zooming out here. And then I want to go ahead and make sure this image is sized correctly. Um, whenever you're working in games, you're going to want to work in powers of two. So what that's going to mean is uh, a 128 by 128 texture, a 256 by 256, a 512 by 512. Uh, I'm going to 512 on this guy right now, uh, just to give you guys an idea. So uh, that's one option for getting your UV template laid out. And then you can pretty much just paint over this area. But uh, to be honest, the alt print screen method is not my preferred way of doing things. I prefer using a little plugin, which is free. You can find it on the internet for free called Textporter. And it allows quite a bit more functionality. You'll find it over in the utility panel once you've installed it under more. Okay, um, and what you'll see is Textportal will be down toward the bottom if you hit OK. Uh, you'll see a bunch of different options here in the utility panel. Okay, uh, there's some information about it if you're curious. Um, it's a really outstanding little plugin. Okay, so up here uh, we can set our size for our output. We'll go ahead and set it to 512 by 512. Okay, and I'll show you by default it's going to be calling Map Channel One, which is our default or uh, what our UV originally was set up to. Okay, I'm going to just show you what it looks like with the defaults by uh, just leaving everything set and choosing Pick Object. Okay, Choose Pick Object, click on your object, and you'll see that it is going to give you a little bit of an outline for this. Okay, um, What I'm doing is a few of these different functions I prefer not to have on. I turn off polygon fill, backface call, and mark overlap so it doesn't flag them in red. I like uh, to work off of a wireframe 
so I uh, uncheck constant and I set my color to white okay now when I pick the object again and click on it okay I'm just gonna get little white outlines which is a really nice clean way to work which I tend to prefer some people like solid colors and that's fine um, I prefer this so I go ahead and uh, save it as a target file I really like this image format because it saves an alpha channel okay so give it a name hit save and save it as a 32-bit targa okay if you want to type in some information about it you can I don't necessarily do that hit OK okay now I'm gonna bounce back to Photoshop here I'm gonna go ahead and open that image up and I'll show you my little uh, workflow for this okay this really isn't a Photoshop DVD but Photoshop really works hand in hand with Mac, so I'm going to demonstrate how I get going on this. Open the file up, and I've got this nice little wireframe of uh, my UVs. Okay, what I'll then do is use this as a template for paint over, and here's how I get started. Okay, I copy my background layer into a new layer. Okay. After that, uh, give it a name. This will be wires is what I'm calling this here. Okay. And then I go into the channel info. Okay. And go ahead and load that alpha channel. Okay. Then what it does is selects all the little white areas. I then invert that. Okay. By going up to uh, invert the selection. And hit delete. So basically what that does is deletes all the black area and leaves me with just the little white wires. Now I add a new layer in the middle. Okay, go ahead and give it a name. Okay, paint here is what I'm saying. Okay, and then I just fill it with uh, whatever I want my base color to be. Okay, and I'm going to go ahead and choose the paint bucket. Okay, and I'm going to go ahead and fill this area with uh, a new color. I'm going to go ahead and pick a brown color for the base of that uh, thing. And the advantage of having that wireframe is what I do is back the opacity of that layer off. Okay, because uh, then I can see it. It's a good little guideline, but it's not so distractingly, you know, visible. So now I just keep working on this middle layer painting away, doing whatever I need to do, and oops, it looks like I did that in the wrong layer. Make sure and do that in your painting layer. And I'll go ahead and fill this with a lighter color, uh, kind of like what we had in the reference image when we were originally working on it. So I'll go kind of a light gray. You generally want to stay away from pure whites when you're doing textures in games. It just looks too glaringly bright. Okay, just leave it a light gray or uh, even a slightly tinted light gray. Okay, after this, I'm going to go ahead and save this PSD file. You notice I turned off the visibility of my wire layer. Okay, and this is going to be my working uh, version. Go ahead and save that. It looks like I had a little bit of opacity in that layer. I just copied it down there. Okay, save it again. And then we're going to go ahead and fire up Max and open up the Material Editor. Okay, at this point, what we're going to want to do is go ahead and make a new material. Okay, this will be the official Pagoda material, uh, at least the working version. Okay, and we want to go down to the maps, and you can either do it from that little shortcut button there or also down in the None button next to that. Choose Bitmap. Okay, make sure you're looking at all files so we see the PSD and we're not restricted to Targos or something like that. Hit Open. 
Okay. Go ahead and assign it and hit show map and viewport. Okay. At this point, you see that um, that little paint over job that we're doing. Okay. Shows up exactly where it should. If we alter this a little bit. Okay. Or if we go in here and do some more painting. Okay, what we're going to see is as soon as we save that, it syncs up to what's going on in Max. Okay, so now you see there's a little bit of a noise down there. Okay, um, if you have photos you're working off of, that would work fine too. You'll just need to uh, make sure you scale the images to fit over your UV layout. You could also do a UV layout in reverse if you've got a real strict photo source you're working from. Um, you could go ahead and lay out your your images first for your texture and then work the UVs right over the top of the images. It's okay to work in that direction too. Uh, I, t I tend to be quite a painter. I like painting stuff. It's, it's just more fun and artistic to me uh, quite a bit and uh, I like challenging myself in uh, making this stuff look as realistic as possible. So I'll kind of just show you a little bit of how I paint, but unfortunately this isn't a Photoshop DVD and it, it takes too long painting the whole texture to show it. So we'll have to jump ahead here in just a minute. But I just want to demonstrate that I can go ahead and uh, make my alterations here, resave it, fire up Max, and you'll see that it automatically updates to show uh, the changes that I'm making in Photoshop as soon as I save it, which is uh, a really nice little feature that Max has. So here's the finished version. Yeah, I know it's a little bit of a big jump, but um, after quite a bit of painting, um, you could come up with something like this. Um, obviously, having photo source if you're not a painter uh, can be helpful in that regard. Okay. At this point, um, what I've got also is I uh, want to talk about the uh, finished version of things. Okay. Okay, what I'm doing is uh, I've actually saved out my bitmap as a, another, as a Targa file this time. Okay, and um, I'm going to go ahead and use my finished version as a Targa, not as a PSD. Usually a Targa is a real common format you'll use for a lot of games for actually submitting the finished version. So I'm going to go ahead and assign that, hit show map and viewport. Okay, and then what we've got is we've got some transparent areas we want hit up. So what I did is in the uh, Photoshop file itself, there's actually an alpha channel. Okay, and uh, in that Photoshop file, so I'm going to go ahead and drag this down to the opacity slot. Okay, and what I want to do is down here, um, you'll see I've got a alpha channel set up for that transparency on the fence and the little rings at the top of the thing. Okay, and I want that to display in viewport, so just go down here and hit uh, where it says mono channel output, choose alpha, so that way that this opacity is calling the alpha channel. And then at the root of your material, hit show map in viewport, so it's showing both the opacity and the uh, diffuse color maps at the same time. Okay, so I'm showing both those maps at the same time rather than just going down and showing one of them. Okay, so once again, mono channel output alpha. That way you can display it in game. Or in, I'm sorry, in viewport. Okay, and we're pretty much all set. Okay, uh, one thing I did since uh, we pretty much smacked these with the planar map, you can see my mapping's actually off just slightly in a few of these areas. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just fudge these UVs over a little bit. Sometimes you need to do a little bit of adjustment after you paint because your painting was a little sloppy. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and just um, go into those UVs and just scale them in just slightly so that I'm not overlapping them into areas they're not supposed to be. Okay, so I'm just going to pull these in a little bit. Notice how that affects the alignment of the UVs. And if you're working off photo source, this is kind of what you, you do the whole time. You just kind of have the picture already there, and then you planar map stuff, and then you just go ahead and make little adjustments to it. So 
so it looks like the inside of my little window frames were kind of spilling out into the uh, little support beams just a bit. So you can just kind of go through things with a real kind of close magnifying glass. Take a look at any little close areas. Think about where the player is going to be looking at this thing from. If the char character or the player is going to only see it from a distance, I wouldn't really worry about little stuff like this, but it's always best to play it safe. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and overwrite my old uh, UV file that I had there just to so I know I'm working on the very finished version of the UVs in case I need to load them up again. We'll talk about exactly why you might need that in the next section. Okay, now what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and add in some scene lighting to this uh, to add a little more depth to our textures. And we're going to bake that lighting into the textures themselves. I could have done a lot of this when I was painting, but uh, it's really tough to sometimes guess um, where your lighting is going to be falling. So I'm going to go ahead and get rid of that reference image. We don't need it anymore. And I'm going to go ahead and add in a light type called a skylight. Okay, in reality, it doesn't matter where this light's at in your scene. It's basically the reverse of an omni. It, it simulates atmospheric light coming in from every direction toward your object. Okay, the problem with it is that um, this light will actually come up from underneath your object as well. And we don't want light, that's real, not very natural in the real world that light comes from the underside of something, especially if it's a big building planted on the ground. So what we're going to go ahead and do is we're going to go ahead and put just a, a temporary box object down underneath this um, pagoda to block out light from coming underneath it. Okay, and I'm just going to shove it just a little ways down below this guy. I'm going to go ahead and make sure this is a nice big ground box that covers a lot of territory so there's no light that's going to leak from underneath. I'm going to go ahead and uh, just assign a kind of a generic brown color to this box. Okay, after this what we're going to do is um, we're going to go ahead and use a global illumination simulation that keys in on that skylight for us. And that's going to simulate really nice kind of soft uh, outdoor lighting. So how we're going to do that, go up to the rendering menu, choose advanced lighting, and then we're going to activate light tracer, which is a, a global illumination uh, solution. Okay, I'm pretty much going to leave most things set to default here. Okay, uh, the only thing I uh, may go ahead and adjust will be the bounces of the light. So this will make the light bounce off of that ground box object. And I'm going to go ahead and do a couple little renders here just to give you an idea of what the overall look of this lighting looks like. Okay, uh, Whenever you have a, a GI solution, global illumination solution, it takes a little while to render. So I'm going to, we're going to go ahead and accelerate this just a little bit so you can see. And what you're going to notice is some very nice soft shadowing. Uh, look on the undersides of the roofs. Uh, you see some nice soft shadowing. It just looks a lot more realistic and what we want to do is go ahead and bake that lighting information into our texture. Okay, so now you've got an idea what that's going to look like. We're going to go ahead and close out of that renderer. <coughs> Make sure your object is selected. Okay, we're going to go up to the rendering menu and choose render to texture. Okay, once that turns on, what we want to do is make sure that this thing is set to map channel 1. And we uncheck auto unwrap. Okay, we want it to use the UV layout that we already set up. Okay, now under output, go ahead and give it a place to go. Okay, it's going to output a new texture file for us. Okay, so I'll just give it a directory where it's going. Okay, you should see uh, the object that's going to be baked is, yes, our pagoda, which we have selected right now. Okay. OK, 
Okay, not going to worry too much about these other settings. They're pretty much good uh, with the defaults. I'm going to want to add in a uh, new map to make. What we're going to be using is complete map. Okay, and that's going to bake in lighting, diffuse color, everything else. Some games will actually use uh, lighting maps, which will be a separate map that's kind of composited on top of um, your diffuse color. But we're going to go ahead and just stick with the complete map on that. After that, we want to uh, make sure that the target map slot says diffuse color. This will be a new diffuse color. And we want to make sure we set it to the right size, which will be 512 by 512, which is what my original texture resolution was. Okay, if you want to rename this thing, you can. Okay, it's called uh, whatever your scene file name is, complete map by default. Okay, go ahead and save it as a 32-bit Targa once again. Okay, you notice I love that Targa image control because it um, gives us alpha channels and lots of good stuff we can work off of. After that, I'm going to go ahead and click the render button. I had already done this earlier, that's why it's saying overwrite the file or not. Okay, and you'll see this thing takes a few minutes to process. It's kind of a complex solution, so uh, we're going to go ahead and accelerate this just a hair. And boom, boom, boom. We should see this come in pretty quickly. Okay, now you'll notice we've got a few little problems. Look at this second floor of our thing and look down below. We've got some real problems with the calculations there. And the reason for that is that we've got UVs with different light lighting hitting them on different sides all overlapping. And that causes a lot of trouble. Okay, so um, what we want to go ahead and do you can see a little comparison here where it chopped off one whole half of that side and the reason for that is that the the lighting is hitting each side differently we've got overlapping UVs anytime you've got overlapping UVs it can be danger when you're trying to bake this into a texture okay using the same uh, UV channel okay so I'm gonna go ahead and reassign my material it will by default assign that new baked material to the object so I am just gonna reassign my old one okay I'm gonna hit the edit window under uh, for the UV layout once again okay and what I'm gonna do is do a file load UVs okay just resaving just to be safe with the layout I've got right now okay and I'm gonna load up the no overlap version Okay, remember I had you save this out earlier? That's why. Okay, that then we're not going to have the lighting problem. So now what we can do is, even though the other sides of the, that thing are not mapped properly, okay, we've got no overlap. So we can go ahead and rebake this thing. So I'm just going to overwrite that. Okay, and save it as 32-bit Targa. Okay, and then go ahead and click Render once again. Just going to double check, make sure all my settings are still set. Okay. And this time, what we're going to see is things are going to come in a lot cleaner. Okay. We may have a little bit of a problem where we've got, it uh, looks like the fence area has a little bit of a tough time. And probably the reason for that is I think I may have been sloppy and overlapped um, both sides of the fence when we planar mapped them. Um, and that was probably my mistake. Uh, sometimes it can be a little bit touchy if two polygons are sitting right on top of each other uh, mapping them correctly. Um, so what we're going to do is go ahead and uh, just pretty much we're going to take that into Photoshop and composite it out in just a little bit. So I'm going to go ahead and load up the overlap version of the UVs and what we should see is uh, things look pretty good. Okay, With the uh, exception of the fence area we're going to go ahead and um, fix that up in Photoshop uh, things look pretty good okay you notice the nice subtle lighting things like that so we got a pretty good start um, it looks a little more realistic because of the subtlety of the lighting uh, the shading it's a little bit better okay generally if I've got a little problems with my uh, baked texture Okay, what I'll go ahead and do is composite it right over the top of my original texture. Okay, and that basically allows me to go ahead and uh, fix any areas I want because I've got the original texture just sitting right there. So I'm going to go ahead and copy that in. 
paste it right on top of my uh, original target texture, the finished version. And I'm going to go ahead and do any touch-ups I want to do. Okay, so it looks like I've got a few little weird things happening. Definitely the fence has problems. Okay, so what I'm going to do is go ahead and go into that layer on and just delete it. Okay, also had a little bit too much heavy shading in that area, so I'm going to go ahead and clean that up as well. That looks really excessively dark to me as well. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, go into that area. Use my lasso tool. And I'm going to go ahead and do that as well. I'm going to go ahead and copy and paste that above so I can just back off the opacity of that thing. Okay, so what I did was copied my shadow layer, uh, of that little portion of shadowing, up to the layer above it. And I'm just backing off the opacity so it's not quite so dark and shaded so heavy. Okay, you can use lots of little tricks like this when compositing um, your textures. Occasionally, if you've got a really clean mesh where nothing's overlapping or anything like that, sometimes you don't even need to composite. You can just run with the, the pure bake. But a lot of times, I, I, get, I get real picky about stuff, so I, I end up uh, making little adjustments and things like that quite a bit. Okay, and I think the overall shadowing might be just a hair much, so I'm going to go ahead and just back that off just a little bit. Okay, so it's leaving my uh, other texture showing through just a little bit more. Okay, and this is all personal preference. Uh, I, I tend not to like to go too heavy on the shadowing because um, there's a possibility I could have my game. Uh, my game might be doing some shadowing as well. It's good to have a little bit of shadowing in your texture, but not so heavy that uh, things get too hard. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and dim down some of these uh, original textures just a bit so they blend in a bit better. So I'm going to just going to do a little brightness adjustment on the, the original layers. So that it blends in nicely. Yeah, that's looking pretty good, pretty close. Okay, once I'm all satisfied, I can go ahead and... Um, Merge all these down or do a layer flatten. Okay, any little other adjustments I want to make, I go ahead and do. I'm going to go ahead and bump the levels just a bit. Okay, brighten things up just a hair. That looks pretty good. Okay, so we've got the... Uh, version without any shading and the version with. Okay, once I'm all satisfied with this, what I'll end up doing is going ahead and flattening the whole thing down. Okay, and just go ahead and resave it. At this point I'm going to go ahead and bounce back to Max and you can see that uh, it's calling that original uh, complete map that we output, okay, and we don't want that. You'll notice that um, if I do a little uh, pick material on this guy, it actually creates uh, a new material for it that is assigned. And it has that uh, kind of two aspects to it. One is it's showing the baked version in the viewport, the complete map. And then it also has the uh, 
original material. Okay, so I don't want to bother using that, so I'm going to go ahead and grab my original material that was that we just composited just a moment ago and just reassign it. So I really don't need that uh, shell material, which is what is uh, assigned by default. Okay, so it's looking pretty good. Um, notice all the subtle shading inside the doorways, underneath the edge of the roof, behind the fence. Okay, it's subtle, but it's uh, quite effective in uh, exaggerating the uh, lighting. Okay, I can at this point I can go ahead and deactivate that light tracer. Go ahead and get rid of the light and get rid of the ground box, which are no longer in use because all that information is now baked into the texture itself. Well, now we're uh, pretty close with this guy, so uh, what we want to do is just kind of go through everything, make sure this thing's going to export properly. Um, looks like I may have forgot to turn on the opacity map there, just so we can see it a little bit easier. Okay. And uh, what we're going to go ahead and do is kind of just double check everything. Okay. Uh, one thing we'll want to probably do is go ahead and convert this whole thing down to an editable mesh. That's just condensing all our mapping information down into the mesh itself. We'll want to go over to the hierarchy panel, hit effect pivot only, choose center to object, make sure your pivot point is centered on your object. And then we we'll want to make sure it's placed uh, down on the Z right down there at zero. Okay, what this is going to do is when you import this into a game engine, it'll make sure it places it in the right area. Okay, we also want to check that with our scaling, it's all scaled to 100%, and if necessary, hit Reset Scale or Reset Transform. Okay, basically that makes sure our scaling is the objects at 100% scale, which some game engines demand. They don't like scaling. Some don't have a problem with it, so it just varies a bit. Okay, we'll double check that it's uh, editable mesh. Uh, editable poly is fine for some engines. And then we want to go ahead and take a look uh, if, for whatever reason, um, things get messed up with pivot points, you can use the utility panel reset X form function. Um, basically, that does a similar thing to resetting your scale and reset, resetting your pivot. Okay, and then after that, you can go ahead and collapse it down, either convert to editable mesh or choose collapse all by right clicking on the modifier stack does the exact same thing. So reset uh, X form is just a big fixer basically if you have some weird issues going on. Then you want to make sure that the object itself, not just the pivot, but the object is dead center of the scene preferably. Okay, unless you have some specific reason that you want it moved in, you know, when you get it imported into whatever your game engine is. Double check that uh, you have a little bit of a basement Okay, that the object actually goes through the floor a little bit. What that's going to help with is if it uh, gets placed on uneven terrain, okay, we won't see any gaps between the base of the thing and the ground since it actually digs into the ground a little bit. Okay, uh, other things we can um, be concerned about is uh, just double check that there's no modeling errors, so we don't have any uh, free floating vertices, anything like that. Okay, if I go to vertex mode, uh, there's an option called remove isolated vertices. You can do this in editable mesh or editable poly. Either one's fine. Okay, but uh, it's a good idea not to have free floating vertices that aren't hooked up to geometry. Okay, there's also a nice modifier called STL check that checks for a lot of these little things like modeling errors, uh, free floating vertices, lots of different stuff. Okay, you can see that's It'll check for lots of different things, open edges, multiple edges, everything. You can choose whatever you want it to check for, and it will go ahead and do that. Okay, So you just check that checkbox, and it'll show you a number of errors down at the bottom. Okay, And it looks like uh, multiple edges I'm okay with. 
I've probably got some open edges. That's where most of mine are. And the reason for that is that uh, remember on those support beams, I blew out the back side of the polygons that were pressed into uh, the mesh. Okay, so those would be open. Uh, some game engines don't like open edges, some don't care. So uh, once you're done with that, you can go ahead and just toss that modifier by clicking the little trash can button. Okay, if you hit uh, 7 on your keyboard, it will show you the number of selected uh, faces okay, for the object or faces for the object. You can also use the old poly counter, which we uh, kind of touched on before. Yet another way to see information about your scene is to go to the file menu and choose summary info. This gives you a lot of information about your scene. It tells you your uh, number of polygons, uh, triangles technically, faces you are using, any textures it's calling, etc., etc. Okay, now what we're going to do is be talking about something called LODs, which stands for Levels of Detail. Some games uh, require that you have varying uh, complexities of mesh for an object at varying distances. What this means is when a player gets up close, okay, they'll see a nice high-res mesh. Okay, So I'm going to go ahead and rename this thing. Uh, Pagoda, like this is going to be our high variation. Okay, so uh, I'm going to go ahead and just designate that. Okay, and then as a player moves away, what he'll see is a, a, a lower detailed version so that less polygons will need to be displayed on the screen. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and go up to the edit menu and choose clone on this. Okay, I'm going to clone a copy of this object. Okay, we're just making an exact duplicate of it. We're going to rename that duplicate um, medium. Okay, so that's Pagoda LOD medium. Okay, really the name uh, depends on the game engine you're using, but they're sitting right on top of each other right now. So I'm going to go ahead and choose select by name, select the high version, and then I'm going to go ahead and choose hide selection. Okay, so now the only thing on our scene right now is the medium version. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and go to the Utilities panel, bring up Polygon Counter for more, and I'm going to go ahead and set a little budget for myself for uh, what the polygon count of this object needs to be. I'm going to set this as 400. Okay, so our original uh, object was uh, 740. Okay, when the player gets more distant from it, we'll go ahead and go down to a 400 polygon version. Okay, and I'm going to go ahead and start reducing this by just selecting little pieces that aren't really that important and just getting rid of them. So the little bells there, when you're a, a quarter or a half mile away from this object, you're not going to see those little bells. So I'm going to go ahead and just delete these elements. I'm in element sub-object mode. That's uh, hotkey is 5 on your keyboard for that. You can see I very quickly trimmed off about 100 polys right off that guy. You can also probably say that that little bit there could go. The little rings could probably go. Um, and I'm just looking for anything I can very easily get rid of. The little beams on the underside aren't very noticeable from a distance either. Okay, and remember we did some extrusion on those, so um, they're going to be quite a few more polys. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and just select those little elements and go ahead and delete them. Okay, when it asks you if you want to remove isolated uh, vertices, yes, I don't want to leave free-floating vertices. And go ahead and get rid of those. You can see very quickly I got down to 416 polys, which is pretty close to my target, but I want to make sure and hit it. Uh, I want to make sure uh, my art director or my art lead is, doesn't get mad at me for uh, leaving too many polys uh, when he told me polys. So I'm going to go ahead and choose target weld here. I'm going to just move those vertices uh, for those little recessed windows out just a bit so they snap to the other one. So I'm getting rid of those little uh, interior polys right on the inside edge of the window. 
that's going to trim down my count really well. And I'm hitting, uh, looks like low 400s right now. And I'm going to go ahead and you'll notice as I'm rotating around this, um, I want to make sure I have arc rotate selected sub object. Okay. If you click and hold on arc rotate, um, you want to make sure that you are using the little icon that looks yellow. Okay. That's going to allow you to rotate around selected sub objects. So when I'm working right on these vertices, it'll actually rotate around that those vertices and not the object as a whole. Okay, so I'm just using target weld, target weld, target weld, and snapping those guys together. Okay, I'm actually a little under 400. I'm going to have a very happy art lead when I'm done with this. Uh, programmers be quite happy. They hate it when your their artists uh, start pushing the polygon counts too high on stuff and fudging stuff. So. Uh, that looks quite satisfactory. I really didn't make uh, too much of a change there. Um, and you look from a distance, this thing probably looks almost identical to the other one when you see it from a ways out. Okay. Okay, my goal is 400. I got under that. I actually hit in the 390s, it looks like. Okay, and I'm going to go ahead and duplicate this guy again for a, a ultra low variation. Okay, I'm just going to do three LODs. Okay, this will be the low variation. Uh, I want to make sure and hide that medium. So I'm using select by name, select the medium, hide it. Okay, and now I'm working on the low variation. So I'm going to set a new budget for this guy. I'm going to go ahead and type in a value here of 200. Okay, and that's the goal for the low variation. Okay, this guy's going to see, be seen from uh, a pretty fair distance away, maybe uh, you know a half mile or further than that. So any little tiny pieces I can get rid of, I'll go ahead and do it. I'm going to select these verts here. I'm going to go ahead and uh, scale them together and use uh, weld selected. Then I'm going to go ahead and target weld them over to the side. Okay, in reality, little mapping distortions like that on the top aren't a huge deal. But if we really start moving a lot of uh, verts around and welding stuff, we may end up having to realign our mapping coordinates a little bit using uh, Unwrap once again. Okay, so I'm going to just go ahead and weld these guys out. Recess doorways, you're not going to notice anything like that from a, far away. So I'm going to go ahead and weld all that stuff. And it looks like I'm still in the 300, so I'm going to really have to start chopping some of this stuff out. Okay, in reality, since all these polygons on this front side are all pretty much on the same plane, okay, uh, you're not going to notice any of that uh, from a distance. You're not going to notice, you know, little uh, recesses in geometry or anything like that. So what I'm going to do is just weld all these verts. It's going to make a big mess for the moment, but I'm just going to weld all these verts. I'm using target weld, okay, so that I'm just reducing the that the geometry that we originally remember we used the uh, edge connects and the uh, insets and all that stuff really diced up that geometry quite a bit okay we're gonna go ahead and just weld all this stuff so it's just a two flat triangles on the front okay just like they are on the sides and we'll end up having to readjust our mapping coordinates here because obviously you can see if you move UV or vert points around it's going to uh, stretch your UVs um, in ways that don't really look too hot. Okay, I'm just double checking that I actually target welded all those correctly. Sometimes I'll click and drag around those guys and if necessary uh, click weld selected. I'm also going to do the underside of this just a bit more. Uh, I don't think that extra little bit of curve would be that noticeable from uh, quite a distance away. So I'm going to go ahead and weld these guys as well. And look for just any little changes I can make where it's going to reduce the polygon count but not affect the, you know, the overall main form of this object. 
Okay, we're just going to do these three LODs. Depending on your game engine, you may need to do more or less. Uh, occasionally, some game engines don't. You don't even have to do LODs, which is nice because it's it's kind of a little bit of a pain doing LODs, but um, doing them well can really really uh, save a lot in your games. I'm going to go ahead and delete these polys on top too. We could probably just weld these uh, all these verts together. So I'll just scale them in real tight. Yeah, we can probably do that whole bunch of them, I'm guessing. Oops, not quite close enough. I need to crank up my threshold a little more. And I'll go ahead and target weld that guy over to the side. Mm, that's probably fine. I'm very close to my budget right here, but I'm still a hair over. So what I'm going to do is turn on uh, the ignore back facing checkbox and select those polys on the insides of the fence. I'm going to assume that if you're that far away there's no possible way you could be back behind that fence and need to see it. So I'm going to go ahead and delete those. And that already put me below 200. So I'm in pretty good shape here. Uh, if I wanted to I could delete some more stuff and make my programmers very happy but um, there's no point. I'm below the budget right now, so I'm going to go ahead and call that good on the mesh. But you'll notice we've got UV problems now. Okay, You'll see that the texture projection on there has been distorted since we uh, altered the geometry and kind of pulled and pushed some points around, and uh, it's really not fitting on there cleanly. So I'm going to go have to readjust those. I'm going to put the unwrap on there once again. Okay, uh, Bring up the edit window. I'm going to go ahead and close out polygon counter. I don't really need it right now. Okay, turn on select face subobject mode once again and select those UVs and take a look at what happened to them. Since we moved the verts around, the UV points also got moved around. So the projection's not hitting flat on where it's uh, supposed to. So I'm going to go ahead and planar map that once again, just like we were doing earlier and then just kind of uh, manually go in there and, and realign those uh, UV points over the uh, correct texture area. Okay, and sometimes you may be off just a fraction uh, compared to uh, where they originally were, like the corners were, and uh, there's no need to really panic that it's off by just the tiniest bit, uh, because in reality um, what the game will do is swap between these guys when they're quite distant so you're not going to notice that your textures are off by a pixel when they're you know a mile away from you uh, it's it's really not gonna matter too much so I'm gonna go ahead and just planar map planar map planar map those guys also do a little copy paste okay I'm gonna go ahead and unhide these guys and just show you the difference between these and it looks like uh, I actually align these guys a little bit off. Okay, so sometimes I'll pull up my original variation side by side just so I can make sure I line things up the same way. Uh, sometimes it's it's a little tough doing it by memory, so that's why I brought up the uh, original one. And I'm going to go ahead and align that while looking over there at the right to see um, where this is supposed to be aligned at. So I just compare them side by side real clearly. That's going to help me uh, to make sure things are accurate. Okay, you'll see me. I, sometimes I bounce back and forth between uh, in the edit UV window between vertex and uh, polygon selection modes. Uh, just sometimes it's easier to use one than another to get your selections correct. Okay, it looks like I'm pretty close, but I've got a little bit of a problem right there on the front side of the deck. And chances are uh, I just need to move one of these UV points over. Maybe two of them, it looks like. Nope. Eh, just smack it with a planar map. Sometimes it's not worth trying to figure out where those little points that you tore into the geometry with uh, need to go. So 
sometimes it's just better off just remapping them with the planar map, like as I'm doing here once again. And that's looking pretty darn good. That's real close. Look at these two. Even from this little distance, you really don't see a whole lot of difference between the two. Sure, the tops are gone, but I'm not going to really be too concerned about that little bit there. Because in reality, I figure most players are going to be running around at ground level. They're not going to see the top of that little nub when they're uh, really far away. Okay, just double check everything. It looks like the undersides of uh, the little roof area may be off just a bit, so I may correct a few of those. Okay, it looks like uh, by welding those um, vertices earlier, it pulled the UVs off. Okay, I just went into my show options and turned up the brightness a little bit so it's a little easier to see. Okay, I'm just going to move these points. A little bit. I'm using scale here. Uh, that's pretty good. That's not too bad at all, really. Oops, a little bit close here. Looks like I got a little bit of distortion in that area. I don't know if it's really that huge of an issue, but we'll just take a look and see what we got going on. Yeah, I think I might be able to live with that. It'll be pretty distant anyways. Uh, we'll just try. We'll go ahead and move these points over and see if it straightens them out. No, not too much, but... I don't really think it's worth it. Um, this is a real low LOD, so it's going to be seen from a very, very far distance. And I don't think you're going to notice if the, the UVs are just shifted slightly, as I think they are here. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and collapse this down. Okay, you can also right-click on the object itself and choose Convert to Editable Mesh or Editable Poly, whichever you uh, prefer. And I want to move my original LOD back over, so I'm going to do a type in here and make sure it's at zero once again. So they're sitting right on top of each other. Okay, and I'm just going to kind of flip between these, and you'll see that you'll probably see this guy pretty far out, something like that. After that, you're going to move in a little bit and see the medium version, maybe right about there in the game. And after that, you'll uh, get the high version when you walk right up to it. So this is looking pretty good here. Um, and generally when I do my LODs, I do do them manually just as we were doing. Uh, I go in there and, and actually make the choices of what parts of the geometry should be uh, blown out and which should be kept, uh, which are most important. There are a couple automated tools you can use, um, but to be honest, I don't always find they're effective for scenery art. One is called Multi-Res. It's a modifier. Okay, If you go ahead and hit the Generate button at the bottom, it allows you to just spin a spinner of vertex uh, number of vertices up or down and it will automatically reduce their poly count. Okay, this tends to be good for organic stuff, but for scenery stuff, sometimes it's not so smart. That's why I do it the manual way. Um, I just find that it is a little bit more efficient to do things manually. Uh, the computer is just not as smart. 